fell into or discovered that I wanted to paint for myself instead of for clients. And watercolour was the most accessible to get myself started. Had a couple of exhibitions based on work from my mind. And then uh, in 2013, discovered plein air painting, which is what I am now as a plein air watercolour painter. Boy, do I have a treat for you guys. Not just there's snow here in California. I have a wonderful interview with Barbara Tapp has so much life experience and she's a plein air painting. So let's go to that interview right now. Wow. Thank you so much, Barbara, that you would say yes to me asking about your watercolor adventure. So my first question for you to get this going is, could you share a little bit about who you are and how you got started with watercolor? Uh, okay, my, my name is Barbara Tapp and I'm originally from Australia. Uh, my husband and I took off and traveled around the world when we were 24 and 26. My background, uh, oh, we ended up coming to the United States uh, for 18 months and then ended up staying here. I graduated in interior design uh, and in that I actually learnt uh, a little bit of watercolour in taking rendering classes, but I only took one semester of rendering. So uh, my first job straight out of college was at, in a zoo, in the major Sydney Zoo, exhibition designer, and mainly used my ability to draw, which I identified when I was about 12 years old. Um, and uh, anyway, fast forward, came to the United States in 1980 and had three kids, but also um, just sort of painted for myself um, because I wasn't actually legally allowed to work in this country. So I ended up teaching a few people and uh, watercolour was accessible. It didn't take up much in storage. Um, it was just basically paint and paper. And so I dabbled with that and then met a lady who was a writer of books, ended up illustrating 14 travel books for her. And my first sort of introduction to using watercolours was doing the covers for the books. Uh, and then 35 years later, um, I've ended up having a very successful architectural rendering business. And in 2008, during the recession, uh, all my sketches prior to that were in black and white. And I was doing sometimes over a thousand houses a year. So drawing a lot in pen and ink, uh, which were used in the newspapers for um, advertising and then also as gifts and then on the fronts of the brochures. But in 2008, there was a recession and my business was cut down to a, th a third. And I had kids in college at that time and in high school. So I ended up thinking, how could I compete against uh, the digital cameras that were all coming on the market? Uh, so I went to colour. And that's where I really got my sort of initial experience in watercolour. And then in 2013 or 12, uh, <clears throat> fell into or discovered that I wanted to paint for myself instead of for clients. And watercolour was the most accessible to get myself started. Had a couple of exhibitions based on work from my mind. And then uh, in 2013, discovered plein air painting, which is what I am now as a plein air watercolour painter. Uh, this, is, and this is why I wanted to interview you because you have so much experience. You have so much knowledge about what it takes to be an artist. And I like the fact that you did talk about commissions because some painters and new artists, they only think the only one way is a gallery way. And then there's the other question we'll pop into, the difference between uh, painting for yourself versus for a paycheck. Uh, but before we go there, one of the questions I think is really relevant is, what do you find most rewarding about watercolor painting? Uh, I love to answer that question. I am a water baby and I grew up on the coastline 
in Sydney Harbour and a mad keen sailor and uh, loved to swim, swimmer, but just love being in the water. For me, it's pigment and water play. Can you expound on that, pigment and water play? What, what does that mean? That's good. Uh, okay, so the transparency of watercolour and the magic that it does on paper is it, it satisfies my curiosity. I like feeling as though I've got a loose frontier that I'm not actually controlling with my mind intentionally. Uh, it's much more expressive. Uh, when I first started painting, 20, you know, 2013, I did not know colours. I did not know values. I didn't know anything about watercolour. I just knew that I loved the way that it moved across the paper and that I, how I could use it on a brush. And um, my work was very key, which meant very light. I didn't have much contrast in my, in my paintings at all. And what's happened with watercolour for me is that it's been this exploration frontier, basically, a, a, a land that was not predictable. And for me, that's very exciting as a painter. Can you tell us about the importance of having good materials like paint, paper, and brushes as a beginning artist? Uh, you know, I think that there are so many new products out there. The small kits, actually, this is a little, a little roundy travel palette that, that you can buy that's very affordable. The pigments have improved in their intensity. Uh, originally, I learned to paint with the Prang watercolor boxes, and they were also student quality paints. Now, I, th I don't think you need to even go near student quality paints because all of the paints that are out there, the Cotman's, the uh, Rowney, the, um, the, the beginner levels that they say, the pigments are so good and so intense that you start off to begin with, with very good color. And it was the, the actual textures of the painting, the paint itself, much more easily now with water than they did originally. Tell us, I know you do a little bit of both. Can you tell <laughs> me what's, what's the benefits of painting indoors and the benefits of painting outdoors? I love that question. Um, okay, so well, the benefits of painting outdoors is the, again, satisfying my curiosity. I want, I'm a storyteller painter. I, I journalize. I, my subjects are conversations that I want to explain to people of what I'm seeing in life. And being outdoors gives me that opportunity. And I think that came from traveling so much to take all the photographs of the houses that I was drawing that I saw so many different landscape scenarios and the way people were living and uh, painting for me satisfies my subject matter. Uh, indoor painting is generally working from either my imagination, which is I have paintings up the back here that are purely from my imagination, and they tend to be more designed, more free-flowing, uh, more experimental, um, less boundaries. I tend to use things like softer edges and sharper edges, and I pay more attention to colour balance, which is, you know, contrasting my colours against each other. So I'm applying a different brain approach when I'm indoors and a design approach than when I'm outdoors. And to be honest, having sat in a studio for 35 years drawing houses in a very small format of a drafting table, I'm tired of that. I, I want the freedom of the outdoors. And, the, and that can come with wind, that can come with uh, heat, cold. Um, it can come with people around. It's an environmental influence on your painting that is uh, very stimulating, very exciting, actually. I like that answer. I would say something similar to that. Um, what are some tips that you would give to an inspiring artist? Okay. Um, Inspiring people is actually 
where I'm headed, I think, for the rest of my life uh, because this is something that anyone can do. A anyone can take a brush and a, any kind of colour, doesn't matter whether it comes from, you know, a paint or an ink or any of those things, and they can express themselves. And um, I think that whole thing of um, painting being something that you don't have to necessarily take a class to do, that you can do yourself through your own self-motivation and from looking and that's the appeal for me um, in wanting to inspire people to realise that they don't have to, um, no, no, that, that they can do this. That, that it's just waiting for them. It's not something that we have to take a class. You can go and pick up a colouring book in a store and colour, and that in itself will feed you to the next thing. So a, a lot of the work I do is actually experimental. I'm, I call myself also a sketch painter. painter. So a lot of the things that I'm doing are informing me about the next thing that I'm going to do. And I think that you just have to have the courage or the question to say, well, what would it be like to paint with reds and yellows and oranges today and just splash them on paper and feel what that's like? Um, it's non-toxic. You just need a few brushes. You can go and buy yourself what I call a block of watercolour paper so that you're not scared about using one sheet. You just take off the one sheet and go to the next one and go to the next one. Or you have, which I think is very important, is sketchbooks. You know, I, I have a whole lot of sketchbooks. And, in fact, that's where I began. You know, the first, the first things I did were, you know, I went out and did this in my sketchbooks. But that, that's a little more ambitious than probably people who are going to start. But I, I say buy yourself a really good quality sketchbook, get yourself a small pocket of paints, a little paint box, and just go and dabble and draw something in the kitchen. Draw something that you're interested in. Flowers is a great place to start. One of my favorite paintings you did or sketches that you did while we were all stuck at home during COVID was you did your dishes sitting in the drying rack. And I thought that was just fabulous. It just, it spoke to me and it reminded me I needed to go do my dishes too. And uh, it was real. It was like a real thing. And, you know, um, it takes a, a good minute for a beginning artist to think about, could I draw and paint everything? Well, why not? And uh, I, I love seeing that approach in your work. Getting comfortable with pencils or, or pence or these can be, you can do this with a brush, but just sitting with a pencil and drawing shapes and uh, drawing patterns uh, and doodling is actually very inspirational to begin with. How have you seen watercolor industry change since you started painting? Uh, well, the watercolor industry is, you know, what's going on there uh, I'm not a great person who reads through magazines. I'm more a person who does things by my own or with artists. I do follow a lot of artists on Facebook and on Instagram, so I'm informed by what they're doing. Uh, watercolour for me hasn't changed. I think I'm a little old-fashioned, which is dictated by uh, the fact that my father was an architect and he also did holiday watercolours. Um, I inherited his watercolour boxes, which are all Windsor and Newton from the 1930s. Um, the pigments have changed, the quality of the paint has changed, the choices that we have, the fact that we have metallics, we have uh, watercolour sticks, which is in itself where you can combine drawing with watercolour itself and then ignite them themselves. That's very, very exciting. Um, there are all sorts of things that I think for a beginner is uh, some tools that they can explore, experiment with. Um, I'm past that. I, I have basically my um, 
you know, this is my watercolor box, which I change regularly around. And um, I'm, I've decided on the colors that I like. I do change occasionally when I hear something, I add it to my palette. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, I think because I do competitions as well, one of the areas I think that there is a big change in watercolors is actually the way that they're presented. And it used to always be matte and framed. And now we're getting this method where we don't need to have glass and we can wax or we can spray with um, a fixative uh, to protect the watercolors. Um, and so that's a big change. That's a modern change to the presentation of watercolors. I, I, I'm not a great, I've done it myself and I'm not that comfortable with it because I think I need to live another 50 or 60 years to see the longevity. And I'm not gonna do that. That's so good. And how is your plein air set up different than your studio set up? Honest, I don't paint in the studio. And I don't, I'm, I paint my paintings outside and I don't bring them in to the studio to do work on them. Um, I, if, it, it's an interesting question. So there are competitions, okay? So the arena in which where you get to display your work is important. Um, I choose to enter competitions, plenty of competitions, and that's primarily where I'm sold. And the reason for choosing that is I love painting outdoors. I love the camaraderie. And I love the fact that I'm going to places that I don't know and getting the opportunity to paint there. Um, if I do come into the studio to do a studio painting, uh, it's generally an analytical approach to a photograph that I will have taken that I want inspiration from. And my work tightens. The washes tend to be more calculated and, and I direct myself in approaching how to produce a finished painting from edge to edge and the full design. It will be backed up with preliminary sketches, preliminary, you know, uh, plans, ideas, and drawings. So there's a lot more writing. In the field, I have a sketchbook. Um, I don't have one here with me. And I will look across the sketch it out in my sketchbook, and then I will write on the edge of the uh, preliminary sketch thoughts, which might be cloudy, moody, gray, uh, or warmth, or joy, or any kind of feeder word, um, and I will then use that sketch to um, do my, you know, plein air painting. That's so good, and I want to go into competitions, but before we go there, what I want to talk about is what are some mistakes that people are doing when they go out plein air painting? I'm not one to say that people make mistakes. I think everything's a learning curve. We there are no mistakes. It's just a case of, oh, well, that didn't work and I'm going to approach it this way so that this might work. Um, possibly people are not comfortable. So you have to get comfortable in, in your plein air setup and maybe people just don't realise that they are better sitting while they're painting rather than standing while they're painting. I, I use a French easel. I have bought plenty of the other more modern and it does not suit the way I stand. And that's ergonomics. Um, you know, that's where my hips are much more comfortable and my stance is much more comfortable with my flat, my French easel set flat. I don't have it raised up like this. I don't paint with the surface on a, an angle. I actually paint on a flat surface. And then the more unusual thing about what I do is I often hold my, my board like this and I paint holding it in my hands and I can run and tip the washers around. And there aren't too many people who do that. I can actually manipulate myself into more shade if I need it. But I don't, 
I don't think people make mistakes. They just think that they're there to learn what works for them and what doesn't work for them. And it did take me a while and I have been game to try other setups and basically I keep going back to the old French easel. What would be a good reason to enter a plein air competition? Well, I've been there. <laughs> um, I have to say, when I decided that I wanted to do plein air painting, I didn't know where to start. I didn't have a clue. And I was sitting in my little studio and saying to myself, well, there must be people out there who paint plein air. But at that stage, I was in no conversations with um, any groups. I wasn't on Facebook where I knew anybody. So I went down to Barnes and Noble and I bought every single magazine I could find on plein air painting. And I went to the back section where there were classes and, you know, the names of different people. And it was those people I then looked up um, to get some information about. Okay, I've lost track of what was the question. <laughs> no, that was really good because also, I, uh, when you're really hungry for something to learn, you want to dive in and research it. Like, what do you, what are you getting yourself into? And you were talking about in some magazines, like Plain Air magazine or some books. Uh, I know you can get books at the library on Plain Air. I tell some of my ladies that are going out for the first time some some basic things that you might want. You know, definitely some sunscreen, a hat. If the mosquitoes bother you, you might want to bring something to swat them off. It's, uh, you got to earn some spiritual grit going out there. I think, uh, it's no difference than throwing a dart at the dartboard, right? So you might not even get close to, uh, the bullseye, but you're on the board. Is that hunger to find out, hey, who do I need to learn from and purposefully? No, that's exactly right. That, and... And I went from absolutely no, not knowing anything at all to uh, actually taking one of the um, live, no, going to the convention. That was it. That's, that's where my, my totally everything took off. I went to the uh, plein air convention. And <clears throat> honestly, it was like a smorgasbord. It was one of the best kickoff things that I could have ever have done was an observer. One of the things I think that's very important is that we learn to listen. And sometimes it's not about talking and doing. It's actually listening to some videos or going to something like the plein air convention or going to the live programs that are on, that are offered by Streamline Publishing, Watercolor Live has been extraordinary as a learning tool. I think that's one of the, in most recent years um, on my career, because it's exposed me in a very short amount of time, which is, we don't, we don't have time. We, you know, we're so busy running our lives. But in the three concentrated days, the exposure that I get to so many artists and so many different techniques and all of that, um, it's completely changed influence a year ago that I changed my whole process of painting, which I'm now teaching to people and showing to people of what I'm doing. So um, that is a, as an influence um, it's interesting because that brings us back to, you know, what's contemporary and what's influencing you. Um, but anyway, the one thing I found was that in when I decided I wanted to learn about plein air because I had taken one workshop, I had this easel sitting in the back of my studio. At, it sat there for 10 years and I didn't know how to open it. And that was the French easel I still use now. And um, I took this one workshop because I was recommended by Thomas Schaller that I should meet Georgia Manser and because we both had Australia in common with each other. And that one workshop, I got bitten. And I got bitten so badly about how an extraordinary, it's not accomplishment in your painting, it's just going and standing outdoors in the fresh air, 
painting. And this, if you saw the beginning paintings that I was doing, you, you'd say, wow, that's just so basic and so simple. I didn't know anything. I didn't know how my colours would react. I didn't know the colours to choose or anything. But the experience was so powerful. And let's say we compete, we compete or we contrast this to going to play a game of tennis, skiing on a ski slope, running on the beach swimming in the sea any of those experiences that you can have in life are you know they they you take home you are enriched and you are you are revived or you are enthralled or thrilled or any of those good natural instinctive things come out in you well plein air painting does it and you're right about people being learning how they're wearing the right clothes and making sure they've got food and water and knowing how to take breaks. Uh, I mean, there's so many things I learned. And then in addition, if you can find a buddy, it's just fabulous time, to, healthy time, good thinking time to spend with a best friend or a friend, a new friend. Your painting, you know, in college, I was more into like figure drawing and mixed media. And then I started hearing about this plain air painting thing. And I had just got over a really bad divorce and wow, I created new memories. I had new discoveries. I was less talking about my old divorce and now just hungry to get out there and have new adventures. What has art been for you as far as discovery? Uh, uh, Gabe, I was a very, very curious, pesky little child who always was saying, why, why? 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 And my curiosity in life in general, be it about people, animals, life, anything, I've always had a really strong questioning mind. And um, painting is just, it, it's just, it, it, I, I ask a question every time when I'm going out. I have an intention every time when I go painting. I actually have sent myself something that I need to discover. And then when I come home, I will actually be able to say in my mind, did I achieve this or did I not? But it will generally lead me to the next question. And, you know, that's what it's about. That's so good. So when did you know that you were ready to start entering competitions? I didn't. <laughs> but I heard through the grapevine that there was a competition in San Clemente that didn't require any um, judging or anything like that. You could just sign up and do it. And I wanted to go somewhere that was nice, which was a beach location from Northern California where I live. Uh, so location appealed to me. Two was the fact that it wasn't highly competitive and um, I didn't know anybody at all. So I thought that that's a good thing. Uh, it was affordable um, to do, like the entry fee or the actual logistics of staying somewhere was affordable. Um, so I, uh, that's what I did. Uh, it was just a case of go, down, go and try this. It was just I'm not sure if I'm going to like plein air painting or in a competition at all. And it, the nerves were very, very bad and the fear of competing in a quick draw absolutely terrified me um now it's uh well i've done it now for six seven years fears there's often we have these fears of how am i going to stand up against the next person you know how how seriously are people going to look at my work or i'm scared of being critiqued i'm scared of looking weak in, in the group, I mean, a lot of, you bring all your fears with you and your anxieties with you. Um, the more you paint, the more those things don't matter. And eventually you end up going to the competitions as yourself. And you, you at times I've had to remind other painters who are struggling in competitions to be yourself. Don't come here and think about the others, just paint yourself. And it's, it will respond, people will respond to it regardless, uh, whether they ignore it or not. Um, the thing is, be true.
to yourself at all times. And that's what I do now. I, I, I go fearless. Uh, it's not about fear. It's about, one, having a great time, two, seeing my buddies, and three, painting myself because this is what I love doing and be me. I love what I do. Um, I love the people I meet. Um, I think I think a reality might be how can or how does the person who wants to be a painter survive? And that's that the the reality is, Gabe, that the economics on this are not good. Um, and I, you know, this is why I had a career because I had to earn money. To, to, I had a talent and luckily I found a way in which to, um, through years of building and through always delivering a project on time, if not ahead, I, I, <clears throat> I would, 24 hours a day I could, I could work. But reliability uh, taught me to run a business well, to be cost effective, um, all those sorts of things. And the reality as a painter is that you have to find your level of where you fit. I, I, I refer to myself as a people's painter. I'm, I'm not up there. I'm not high end. I'm not low end. I'm in the middle. And I certainly paint some great paintings at times. They're the ones that give me, you know, I realize I've hit my target. Um, the rest of the time I, I'm in conversation, just sharing what I do, what I'm passionate about. But the, the, the truth is that it's hard to make a living doing this. Paint from your heart first. And I've found that the paintings that come really from me when I'm really in the zone <clears throat> of creativity, which is the most extraordinary place to be. I hope any artist out there or an aspiring artist or somebody who's thinking about art, that there is this wonderful zone that you can go into. And I have no, I can't even explain, but I think in the word or in the world of pleasure, this is a hundred. It's way up there. But the, the, the sad thing is though, we do have to earn money. We have to pay for our living. And this can't be something that's subsidised. It, it's not like, you know, I think the, the theatre industry is heavily subsidised. You can get grants. You can get things that allow you to paint. And a, and a grant and a sponsorship uh, going to paint in a state park. They're, the state parks have some wonderful uh, programs where you can go and paint, uh, doing fellowships and things like that. Those can be areas where you can practice your craft and sustain being alive and living. Um, I myself still maintain doing sketches for houses because, you know, that, that's a steady flow, although I'm at the tail end of it now. And I have saved and, you know, I've got my life in a pretty good position now. But I still budget on trips and I consider the costs that are involved, the framing costs of um, water colouring is, is, is very high, the transportation and all those sorts of things. And I have now found out the competitions that I go to where I actually make a profit rather than into other ones, which are wonderful to have your work displayed, but you can't sell anything and you've got to be guaranteed to sell at least four paintings or at least I do uh, when I go to an event and I'm not a high priced again that's where I know my level I know who I am I know my audience and I know that you know I'm in the $400 up to $800 sometimes $1200 amount and I fit in that area that is so good. I'm I'm so glad that you shared that with us. You made this whole experience just real. And I guess that's the true piece about being a unique artist. 
people want to look so individualized and especially fall in. I'm an artist because I have purple hair. No, you can be a genuine person, just like you just shared with us over that last, uh, you know, 20, 30 minutes. And uh, I just want to thank you so much, Barbara. Uh, how would people uh, find you and get a hold of you? And I will put that down in the description. Um, I'm on Facebook. It's uh, Barbara underscore tap underscore. Um, I mean, that's the basic one. And then I, I, I have a FASO website, which is Barbara Tap Artist. And you can just Google me. I come up if I get Googled as well. Yeah, yeah. Google definitely knows who Barbara Tap is for sure. Well, it's amazing, Gabe, that seriously in the illustration business, which was, you know, it's 38 years, um, I was known by very few people. And one thing I did learn right from the get-go was to print my name very clearly on my, uh, where I signed all my, and that turned out to be the best piece of marketing I could have ever done. I still do that on my paintings now. So my signature is very legible so that people can find it. Um, yeah, and that's just another piece of stuff. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you coming on to the show and letting people know more about plein air painting. And uh, thank you. Well, I just encourage everybody, try to um, find a little group to go out with, uh, have no expectations other than to be an observer. Uh, practice drawing, drawing is very important. Um, practice washes. Uh, I do have a couple of little tips that I'll give you before I leave. Watercolour and patience go hand in hand. And most of the time we start off with watercolour and we apply too much water. So I suggest that use a container. I, I don't have a container. I, can I just get my container? <laughs> of course. Okay, so... These are the sizes of the containers I go out with. Wow. And here's, here's one that's a little bit bigger. Uh, so as soon as I reduced the size of my containers, I started to paint watercolours with stronger pigment. I reduced the amount of water. You have to change your water often, and sometimes I'll take a bottle and I pour the dirty water into the bottle. I'm not polluting the ground. But... I changed the water frequently. That made a huge difference to the intensity of the pigment on paper. Um, the other thing is the patience. Uh, nobody taught me any of this, not even reading books. Uh, watercolour needs to, to cook or dry. And so when you do your first wash, take a break. Go talk to your friend, eat some fruit uh, or food, have some water, wait. You can touch the paper and see and feel if it's got a bit drier. Leave a little moisture in it. Then do your next layer. And it's the layering and the waiting and the in less water pigment as you're going from more diluted to more pure pigment. Those things will help your whole quality of your painting overall. That's my tips. I love those tips. Those are great. And uh, wow, I'm going to um, also put in the link description uh, one of your demos that you did with Eric Rhodes Publishing. And uh, I'm also looking forward to someone that did a video recording. So yeah, I do. <laughs> there's a lot of great things coming up for you in the future. So we're going to keep watching you. And I'm sure people are going to watch this over again because there's so many notes that should have been taken. Well, thank you. But uh, thank you for the opportunity to chat to you. Yeah, you know, the video is coming out in July. And <clears throat> that was a very interesting thing because I don't talk, I don't talk a lot, even though I've talked to you. Um, I'm quite a solitary person. Uh, but boy, trying to put what you do naturally into words, that was hard. Oh, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I think because we paint innately we paint reactively 
and we're not having to discuss this. Uh, I'm not a teacher. I, I don't teach and I don't do workshops. And um, that's changing a little bit, but uh, I, <clears throat> I don't verbalise. It's a solitary pursuit. When you're in this creative moment, the zone of painting, you're painting, it's between you and your subject matter. <clears throat> the conversation's going on in your head, but you're not having to verbalise the whole thing. So what comes naturally to me to actually have to explain to an audience was so difficult. I'm not sure if I even succeeded. We'll see. I bet you enjoyed that wonderful interview with Barbara Tapp. Be sure to join me as we go next week for another interview as we interview more professional watercolors. Thank you so much. Hit like and share and go ahead and smash that subscribe button. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye.